So would you guys prefer if, if it's rainy like this, I just teach from home and just stay at home? Probably. Yeah? I mean, yeah, maybe. <laughs> the only reason I came was because it wasn't raining very hard when I left. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I'll do that in the future because, uh, you know, it just felt like, well, I don't even know if they're going to show up to class. They could just, they could just stay, stay at home. And, <laughs> and then I was like, yeah. eh, it's nasty traffic. <laughs> Okay, so I'll just be watch, watching for an email if it's like a nasty day, and you know maybe maybe I'll let you know because I, I teach here and then I have to go go back and teach from home for my other class. I mean I could teach from my office here, but it just dual screen setup is a lot nicer, and I just have everything situated. So okay, so I'll, I'll I might do that if we have some more days where it's just kind of uh, looking like nobody wants to to be there. But you have to you have to promise me you'll you'll at least say hi in the chat because I, mm -hmm. I know that. You're there. Okay. All right. Well, since we're here, um, thankfully it was a little less rainy, at least when I got out of the car. Um, we're going to get going um, back to uh, membrane filtration. Um, I uh, was using this slide that we looked at earlier to just kind of copy into our new slide. So that's uh, just something we kind of took a look at earlier in terms of ways to define the what we're removing and all that. So today what I wanted to um, specifically look at is um, kind of the, the pressure-driven membranes, which is basically everything we've talked about so far, um, in relation to membrane fouling and how to understand um, what's going to happen as we continue to operate and the membrane, membranes get dirty um, from all the junk that we're treating in the water. and uh, ultimately, what's going to what's it going to look like when we do reverse osmosis, and how does that change? We're also going to take a, a brief look at um, other membrane technologies, electrodialysis, for example. There's other ways we can make use of um, energy gradients, perhaps to harvest energy um, instead of using the energy to clean water. We could actually dirty some water and harvest the energy of that uh, process happening. Okay, so, um, you know, we, we talked about all sorts of membrane types and whether it's kind of a, a filter media, like a granular filter um, type of thing, micro, ultra, nano. Basically, we're increasing pressure every time in order to get um, the enhancement and filtration. When we get to os reverse osmosis, um, it gets a little more complicated, and so that's going to be something we're highlighting today. Um, but in pretty much all cases, what we're assuming is that the volumetric flux, this J, V, of the total solution is basically the same as what's happening with the water. So whatever is in the water is not really changing it too much. This might change if you end up having a particularly strained solution. Um, maybe you are filtering... Uh, produced water from a like a oil drilling operation and you eject a lot of water and then you, know, you extract that back out and then you have to treat that water. If you were going to apply a membrane to that, it might not be reasonable to assume that by just looking at the flux of water, you're, you're dealing with the whole system because maybe there's other solvents in there that are going to act differently. Um, likewise, if, if you're treating a really, really thick slurry of stuff that Maybe it's something like a, um, what are they called? The, there's some polymers that um, uh, expand in water. You know, it would kind of act, the polymer itself might start acting a bit like a fluid. So it, I can imagine a few cases where this might not be true, but generally for more standard water treatment operations, this is going to be true where the we can just track the flux of water and that's going to describe the whole system in terms of the, the volume going through the um, through the membrane. So, and as we know, we define that as the the um, flow rate through some area for the membrane. Okay. So with that in mind, what happens when we start having fouling? And it looks like okay. There we go. Um, well, if we look at a, a graph here where we have the amount of time on the x-axis, so filtration time, you've been operating for 
a lo long period of time, or you can look at it in terms of how much volume have you filtered thus far. And the assumption here is that you're filtering something that has some kind of phalant in it. Um, so something, some reason you're doing the filtration in the first place. So given that, you're accumulating more and more fouling on the membranes. So if you take a look on the, on the left axis, left y-axis, the permeate through that membrane, uh, the permeate flux through that membrane at some constant pressure is what we're tracking here. That's going to decline over time as, um, as you are fouling the membrane, keeping the con a constant pressure, you're going to end up reducing the amount of uh, flux you're getting out. Okay, so that's um, should be somewhat obvious there. Likewise, if you look at the, the right side, we have um, this transmembrane pressure. If you're going to force it to produce the same amount of water constantly, how much pressure do you need? That's going to keep increasing and increasing. And one thing you can see here is there's a couple of models on each side. And so I think, I think what's going on is the solid lines would be if you just have, um, and I, you know, we'd have to go back and look at the book exactly, but I, I'm going to bet that that's showing what happens if you just have cake filtration or just have one type of fouling, so uh, cake layer fouling. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Whereas these dotted lines, I believe, are describing where you, you end up with more pore blocking inside the membrane itself. And at some point, you're getting to a point where you're the pressure required is just ramping up and it's becoming quite impossible to, to produce enough water. And likewise, it's um, your flux is just really um, down in the dumps. You're getting very poor performance from your membrane, uh, particularly when you compare it to where you started. So um, in terms of membrane cleaning, there's, there's a, a couple things to consider. Primarily is when you're designing your membrane for some operation, what portion of this graph are you going to use, right? So at what point are you going to say, all right, this is not efficient enough, we're going to cut it off, and we're going to um, clean it and hopefully restore it back pretty close to where we began. Now, the cleaning frequency then becomes a question, and how long, how long of the downtime do you have? And so when you're calculating your overall flow rates coming through your membranes, then you have to keep in mind, okay, well, it's gonna be down for five seconds every minute for like a, a quick little shaking type clean or something. Then it's gonna be down for five minutes every hour to do a more thorough clean. And then we have to take it offline completely, do a chemical cleaning every month or something. You know, so you have to end up building those time and the, the lack of flow and even the water that you used, you produce clean water and then to backwash it, you have to use clean water, right? So you're cleaning water, and then you take some portion of that to backwash, and you're wasting that backwashed water. So there's a, a few things to consider here when you take a look at it in terms of the net production that a given membrane system can, can provide. Okay, so a little more about the, uh, the actual fouling here. So when you're considering how your pressure is going to increase, like we were just looking at, um, one way to describe the resistance of a membrane, and I'm borrowing some notes here from the other class, what we've seen resistance as is that kind of fancy looking R, you know, little curlies and stuff. So that's the, the R that we're using here. I just didn't um, take the time to replace the each symbol here. But this is the, the resistance R. And so if we look at the total resistance, we could say that that's going to be just simply the sum of the resistance of the membrane itself, um, just the innate resistance the membrane provides, plus the resistance for kind of an, an inner fouling, which we would, we would consider to be this standard blocking or this intermediate blocking, you know, those, those particles that are growing up on the inside of the um, membrane pores versus, um, and so that plus 
the cake filtration. And so, um, yeah, this was, I was just going to kind of show that same thing here, but we've got put in this new diagram, it works great. So essentially, where's the pressure adding? You know, we, we have some pressure or some resistance, let's say, of the membrane itself, kind of just with uh, nothing. If this is the membrane, we kind of have a separation layer. And then this is just kind of support layer. Then resistance of the membrane would just kind of be that resistance across that whole component. And then if we add you know, a cake layer of particles, cont contribution would be there and so on. So I think, I think you get the, the point here. Um, we can categorize it in different ways. And so if our operation, if we observe that, um, you know, maybe at some point we get this, what we call complete blocking, where the pores themselves are just clogged with the right size particle where it just gets stuck and nothing more happens. Maybe that's the point at which we get that pressure ramping really, really high. And so we, we try to avoid um, circumstances that could allow that. Um, or perhaps this uh, standard blocking gets, you know, and you know, keeps going and going. This intermediate blocking, and then eventually you have so much blocking inside the the membrane pores that you have the same effect. Um, so you can you can kind of imagine a few ways in which this is going to could become a, a situation where you have um, a lot more fouling than you can deal with. The cake filtration is interesting because it's effectively acting as a membrane itself or as a uh, a filter, and in some one in some ways it might be okay to operate through that cake layer and just be doing this cake filtration, um, so long as you can avoid some of these other membrane uh, these other mechanisms that are really going to hamper the permeability and the, the porosity and stuff. So um, cake filtration on the one hand is sometimes okay and on the other hand it's probably the easiest type of fouling to remove just by kind of mechanical means and so when you do uh, backwashing you might not get all the the stuff that's stuck in the interstitial pores um, you might have to do a harsh chemical cleaning to get those out whereas the cake filtration if you backwash or maybe even apply it sometimes you do like a, a bubble scouring across the membrane um, I'm, talked about membrane bioreactors before and a lot of times they'll just use the bubble action that's um, present for the for the sake of growing the, the microbes that are doing the biological activity they'll place them such that they're constantly um, agitating the membrane surface and hopefully knocking loose uh, some of the particles so uh, it's definitely something that uh, can be designed sometimes you'll have membranes that vibrate every so often or maybe even continuously again just aiming to keep uh, keep these fouling um, components under control okay so another um, graphic here if we take a look at uh, kind of the effects of membrane fouling on um, again the same thing we have the the pressure here in the x-axis and the flux the y and you know we can we're, we're taking that as um, uh, kind of a steady state flux so that means we're keeping the constant flux we're changing the pressure here so instead of looking at the operation time we're looking at just the how the the flux is changing if we change the um, if we change the pressure now we let it get to that steady state so it's equilibriated so we're looking at um, the flux of an established membrane at a given pressure and then we're just taking a look at how that will change if we if the pressure has changed um, okay so we can we can take a look this uh, the phalant free flux this dotted line here that's going to be a you know kind of our standard standard bear for us the control where we see if we have increasing pressure we just expect increasing flux um, simple as that we've seen that from our equations before 
it's a uh, something we we do expect right we apply more pressure we get more water out um, however um, in reality when we have some fouling um, there there is an effect where after some amount of pressure is added we start having a, a tailing off of the flux and so and i guess we're looking at a couple of different things here the the graph is showing the permeate flux versus the specific flux um it's, i don't think we need to worry about that too much it's let's just consider this a permeate flux because the that specific flux is um I think that's just not normalized by the. What was it? I'm I'm forgetting the uh, the specific distinction there, but we'll just look at the the one, and I think that's what's most meaningful right now. Oh, specific flux isn't that um, specific to? Is that normalized by the pressure? It's escaping me. I thought it would be permeate area, but that's what I was going to say, but that's flux anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, I might I might take a look at that um, towards the end of class, see if I can figure that out, uh, come back to it. Um, but regardless, we see that we have kind of a region where the flux is pretty much linear with a pressure, pretty much the same as if we didn't really have much fouling happening. Um, and so in that area where where we see right here, we could call that the pressure limited, where any addition to pressure is going to add more, more flux. But at some point, um, we're starting to get to a point where with more pressure, we're getting more mass transfer limitations, um, especially in a condition where we don't necessarily have foul and free flux. We have like a, we're actually filtering something that has particles um, or other contaminants. And so in that sense, we end up in a region with mass transfer limitations where um, simply pushing that water through, we're getting diminishing returns given, um, given these fouling effects. So at some point, we might not get any benefit at all from adding pressure, right? So we, we want to consider that as well when we're, if, especially if we're gonna operate in constant flux um, mode, which is often what we need to do in practice um, to supply a given demand, this constant flux, in order to achieve that, how much are we having to ramp up the pressure, right? So if, if we needed, um, if we're trying to aim for this much flux and we, we go from right here all the way up to here just to increase <laughs> increase a flux this much, right? So that's a very small increase in our flux for a very large increase in our pressure. So that's definitely something to keep in mind and would probably be another guide to when we when we want to wash our membranes or, or uh, clean them. Okay. Along those lines, we can also take a look at um, how much uh, how much um, pressure we need to apply given some amount of filtration time that has already passed. Right. So some amount of so as as we go on the uh, x-axis here, we basically have a fouled membrane, more and more fouled membrane. The, the longer we go. So what we're seeing is that flux is dropping at a given pressure. So this transmembrane pressure. So the transmembrane pressure one here, um, we're applying, I don't know, let's say one Pascal or whatever. Um, over time, we end up here. So we, we bump that up and say, okay, now we're at the TMP2. We do get that increase and that, that increase stays, uh, stays above the first one so we can see we're, we're in that pressure limited range, even with the fouling, right? That would be, the, these two here are falling in line with this range because we're seeing that increase in pressure is corresponding to an increase in flux. Um, even in the case for the, uh, the solid 
solid line, which does have um, fouling occurring. However, if we keep bumping up the pressure, so this going up on this graph, or so you know, each time we increase the number here, we're increasing the pressure, that's essentially the same as going to the right on this graph. So we're, instead of in this range, we're heading that way um, because we're sequencing these higher and higher pressures here. So when we, when we do that, we see this, this transmembrane pressure three, we do get a big boost in our flux again, um, and it's giving us um, pretty good flux all the way up here. However, at some point, we're, we're reaching an asymptote. Um, we're never really crossing this, uh, this flux limit here that it's um, drawn. And that's really the, the effect we're seeing um, as this flux reaches kind of a, a linear or a, a flat portion here where it's any addition in pressure is really not doing much to the flux. So we can kind of see that in two ways, Check, checking how the how the flux performance is occurring over filtration time at different set pressures or by ramping up the pressure and, and just watching what happens. So just a um, couple, couple more um, illustrations there, why we care about um, that fouling. So what does it look like when we actually do clean the membranes? Well, you'll see pretty often graphs like these, if you're ever dealing with membrane processes, maybe you would be um, in charge of collecting these data uh, yourselves. So what we, what we see here is that specific flux. Okay, so and this is saying the units for this specific flux, that's, okay, liters per square meter per hour, that's flux, but it also has pressure on the bottom. So given, divided by some pressure, that's what was going on. So if we we'll just take a quick look back here. So it was, yeah, so it was pressure normalized for this guy. So the flux is actually, the specific flux is decreasing as we increase the pressure. Okay, that makes sense. The specific flux, so the flux divided by pressure is constant as we're increasing pressure in that early phase. And then as we're increasing the pressure further, we're getting a smaller and smaller specific flux, which is flux per pressure. Okay, so it was kind of a redundant point there, but that makes sense now. Okay, so taking a look here, we're just looking at that, you know, whatever pressure we're providing, we're looking at the flux given that pressure, and we're watching how that specific flux is decreasing, and then we have a cleaning event, and this, um, this specific flux is restored to some extent. So we see we start just above 15 liters per square meter per hour per kilopascal, goes down to maybe six or so. Um, when we clean, we jump back up to here, maybe 13. And what, what it's showing here on the graph is we've got some irreversible fouling. So irreversible here, meaning that the, the mechanical cleaning um, step is not sufficient to remove that fouling to restore the flux to what it used to be. So kind of taking a look back to our fouling models here, what we might say is that, you know, that the large portion of that flux recovery was probably coming from cake filtration. Um, remove that uh, cake layer from the filter and then we're good to go. Whereas there's some portion of that fouling that is either just stuck really strongly or is maybe already starting to block the interstitial components. So that would be very likely the, the irreversible portion of that um, component. And we see here, if we continue operating, so that was cleaned after, I guess, an hour and a half, 90 minutes, 100 minutes, something like that. We continue and do another cycle and we go and you see this is the specific flux is kind of tapering off to a point. And so there is, there is some balance, right? We, we could just clean after the first like half hour. Um, but you know, it, there's, there's a balance in mind in terms of 
how much are we willing to let it drop, um, balancing that with how much water are we going to be able to produce if we're just stopping it every, every few seconds. So anyway, um, we see here again, there's another addition of irreversible fouling. Um, so this one only came up to here, and this one only came up to here. So this is a pretty harsh example in terms of not getting very good recovery. I've seen other graphs like these where you know it's it's kind of closer to to the starting point even after many cycles. Um, this one here, it looks like after five hours you're ready for a chemical clean or or something like that. So, and this will depend, um, I guess, obviously on what kind of phalanx you have. Um, and then this this also brings in a lot of relevance to what what is your membrane made of and how is that interacting with the phalanx. So we talked um, some time ago about hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity, difference of charged surfaces. Those types of components come back and, and play a role here where if your membrane, if you can design it so that the types of particles that would be a really big problem and that we observe to be the kinds that get into the interstitial spaces and cause irreversible fouling, if we can prevent those from sticking or from adhering to the surfaces by selecting the right kind of membrane, then we can improve our performance overall by avoiding um, this type of drop. If we can keep it all more on the reversible side, then that gives us a much more efficient membrane uh, across time. So there's that's a, that type of research is a fair component of uh, the membrane membrane sciences. <clears throat> there's also some uh, some research in terms of membrane healing. Uh, if you were to imagine um, filtering stuff all day long every day, they do get damaged eventually especially if you're applying harsh chemical cleaning, stuff like that. Um, you can potentially damage a membrane, maybe a particle just kind of nicks it. Then you have a hole. Do you have to replace the whole membrane now that you have you know, a hole much larger than it should be and all the flows going through there? Like there, there is a, an important question there in terms of um, what to do about damaged membranes in, in the process. So um, some some membrane scientists are looking at and engineers are looking at membrane healing. So designing some sort of polymer where maybe if you treat it with something, um, you know, every once in a while, it'll allow it to cross link, but not block all the pores and give you some sort of a repair mechanism. So that's, that's another kind of interesting component of where membrane science is heading. Okay, so wanted to touch on um, as we as we move from simply the the pressure pressure driven into reverse osmosis and electrodialysis kind of stuff, I wanted to to des describe for you what's going on with um, kind of the a force balance for those types of membranes. So whereas everything we've talked about so far is really we just apply pressure that's going to push water across the membrane. Um, when we get to reverse osmosis in these types of um, systems, we have to understand the force balance because um, when we're dealing with high, high salinity water, we're going to have osmotic pressure. Um, and given the name forward osmosis, you know, forward or reverse osmosis, you can imagine that that osmosis is going to be a big component. We're going to have a membrane that's allowing osmosis to occur and to control that process. How many of you guys have seen the uh, the 90s cartoon Osmosis Jones? Maybe? Oh, wow. Nice. I asked that to an undergrad class you know, like a, a year or so ago, and there's like two people out of 80. <laughs> I was so disappointed. Shame. I had to I had to pull out the uh, pull out YouTube to show them what I was talking about, and they all just like. I should have, yes. So it's it's kind of funny. I you know. It doesn't even have much to do with osmosis, but it's uh, it's, it's in the name. So. I I looked back at it and I was like, man, that's been a long time. 
He's like, I think it's about some sort of like antibiotic in a germ or something. Tylenol germs running around everything. Yep. Okay. So, so force balances. Um, in the general sense, what we can, how we can describe our the forces at play for um, for some gradient uh, given some free energy E here, we would say the force in direction X is going to be, we can describe that as dE dx, so negative dE dx. So the negative of that um, free energy um, across space in the X direction. So that's, that's just kind of a, a simple generalized form that's describing what's happening with a, a gradient. So we have um, the x direction. If, if we have, and I'm just going to draw smaller or larger lines here just to, to kind of visualize more or less energy across x, the x direction. So what we're talking about is um, if we have higher energy this higher energy in the first spot and you're decreasing over over there this is going to be exerting a force in that direction um, and that's the negative of the way this is increasing so if de dx is positive that'd be positive going from right to left so that's why the, there's the negative there's so that's that's the way I think it's appropriate to conceptualize that. So we could do that in the y direction as well, um, obviously, or any direction. Um, so when we talk about um, reverse os osmosis and really even getting down to nanofiltration, what we need to look at is that force in terms of, um, we can define it in terms of Gibbs free energy. Okay, so we can look at a force balance with Gibbs free energy where um, this force here is really that the, the force that where the concentrate wants to go to the permeate. Because remember, osmosis is where we have some sort of perme semi-permeable membrane. We have highly, um, highly saline solution versus clean water on the other side. And the clean water is going to want to go towards there um, because in some sense, um, let's see, this would be the lower energy state, right? So we have um, either the salt wants to come across or the water wants to go and join the salt because, as, okay, so with with all that salt ions right there as, as they are, that's a higher energy state than if they were di diluted. Um, be the way to, to see that. Okay, so that's um, the osmotic force. And we can actually take a look at several different types of what we call Gibbs free energy. I've heard of it in terms of the chemical context many times, where we have um, this equation here for some uh, chemical reaction. And that reaction is kind of defined by that activity of that molecule the natural log of that times um, the constant times the temperature in kelvins and and all that okay so we have have some understanding some recollection of gibbs free energy in the chemical sense it's a chemical reaction going to happen um, and we can actually potentially use that in for chemical reactions in a electrochemical sense if there's um, something happening like that in a um, like a, a microbial fuel cell type of situation or in batteries, that may be the, the right um, expression of energy and it may it may apply in addition to some of the other things that are happening. Um, mostly what we're looking at is this uh, pressure based where we have some mechanical pressure as described um, by this and that's, we're looking at essentially the pressure minus one atmosphere you know, if, if it's open to the to the room 
Um, let's see, this V, actually don't know what that is at the moment. So we could go take a look at that. Um, we can also describe the electrical um, free energy. So that would be like an electrical field. And we have it defined here. Um, and essentially what we want to do is we want to take a look at the three of these together. So the total energy would be the sum of, sum of each of these. And I, I'm bringing this up because we can have that chemical energy, we can have that pressure applied, and and actually, I, I think the um, the osmotic pressure here might might come into play as as a chemical reaction it wanting to go through. Okay, so when we when we want to set up a reverse osmosis system, we need to make sure we're balancing. Um, you know, we, we need to understand the pressure, the energy that exists there in order to know how much pressure we have to add to the membrane to cause it to happen in reverse. All right, so that's, that's where we're going with it. So if we define our osmotic pressure with that, you know, that chemical equation and then make that relationship with the delta P, the, the difference in pressure that we're applying across the membrane, we can have that um, we can equate it that way and then understand, okay, what pressure do we have to apply? Um, and essentially we're defining this uh, osmotic pressure that way. So just again with, with all these pieces written out. So if A of some species W, that's the activity, if W is water, that's the activity of water. So if we're looking at um, the, the Gibbs free energy of the solution versus the pure water. So we're looking at a case where we have um, uh, pure water next to, you know, some salty conditions. We can define it that way. <clears throat> and so essentially what we're looking at is whatever actual effect of the solutes on that chemical gradient uh, or the free energy of the, the chemicals there, we can know we can define that in terms of the activity of water and the that constant R and the temperature. So we can um, we can then get a hypothetical um, effect of pressure change given that um, given some volume. Okay, so that V was volume. Um, so here we're relating it to that mechanical portion, right? So the mechanical energy was volume times pressure minus one atmosphere. So the, uh, the equivalent pressure here, we can, we can see what, what amount of pressure is, needs to be applied in order to have these two things balanced. And I think I've got a diagram in the next, in the next slide that shows that balance happening um, in a normal osmosis system where we just watch what happens, how much water is pushed in either direction. Okay, so with that, we can say that that equivalent um, pressure that we're adding, or that uh, essentially that transmembrane pressure um, that is equivalent to that osmosis pressure, um, we can define that in terms of the activity of the water, RT, and the volume of water here, and ultimately derive um, from all of this, um, essentially a meaning for osmotic pressure and a definition for it. So we can define that as, well, one, the negative of the pressure required or the negative RT divided by volume times the natural log of the activity of water. Okay. So uh, what does that look like in terms of transporting uh, water across a membrane here. Um, again, our membrane that's going to be semi-permeable here, in this case, um, we're not letting the solutes through, but we're going to let the water through. So it's, you know, we're, we're getting to a point where that Osmosis Jones guy is taking some part, right? The, the idea of cells having these membranes that 
can control the, the transport of solutes. So our cells can control whether or not sodium uh, or other ions are going across. They're not like high-tech membranes that have been fabricated and they're polymeric or whatever. They're biological in nature. They're composed of uh, biomolecules and controlled. And in that sense, they're very high-tech, if you're going to call biology <laughs> technology. But um, you know, they're very complex, but they're not something synthesized for, you know, so it's, it's a different feel in terms of the cell. Um, we can make osmosis membranes, um, but in kind of a biological system, a lot of times they're just balancing that transport of solutes across. So when we make these membranes and we can balance that transport, on the left here we have a system, and we'll, we'll imagine this at time zero, we, we have poured the systems, uh, the membranes in place, but nothing's happened yet. Um, what we see, it, the, the diagram is showing us is that um, we have uh, no change in osmotic pressure here, um, and the, the delta P is zero. So in, in this case, um, you know, either we're looking at it before any equilibrium equilibration has happened, um, or I think the way it's describing it here, because there's, um, I think this is, they're the same solution. Nothing's happening if they're the same solution, right? Um, Alternatively, you could say you're, I guess, applying some pressure here, but I, I think it's, it would be easier to look at this as, as if this was, they're the same, whereas on the right, we have something where they're different. We have pure water on the left and a, um, a solution that is now diluted. And here we have this change in osmotic pressure is equal to this this difference in pressure. So what what we see here is the water pushing from the pure water side into the um, salty side is pushing so much water up that this this pressure is going to be a, so this amount of pressure that's associated with this height has occurred. So we can measure that amount of pressure that is. We can measure the osmotic pressure by looking at how much pressure has it has driven upwards, right? So we can see exactly how much um, pressure is driving here. So that delta P, we can say that's equal to our um, delta osmotic pressure. And we can also take a look at that in terms of the density of water times the acceleration due to gravity times that height difference that has changed. Okay, so we can directly measure that that pressure in that manner. Okay. Whereas, I guess on the left, either it's not permeable yet, or they're the same, or whichever way you want to look at it. Essentially, now we have it in this way. Now, we can actually reverse this if we, if we want to do reverse osmosis, because this was osmosis right here. Um, so if we want to do reverse osmosis, then what we do is we apply pressure here and instead of just allowing it to increase we're pushing down on it to the point where clean water will go towards the other way now there's there's something very uh, important here because we we see we have to drive against that pressure right there's some rumors sometimes out on the internet and wherever else that the the miracle um, material graphene or some other fancy new membrane material. So graphene, by the way, is like a whole bunch of um, complete carbon that's made up of lots of essentially benzene rings, but in a plane uh, where they're just repeating forever. Um, and so they're all carbon, no hydrogen. I guess maybe at the very edges, they'd probably be hydrogenated. Um, but people are like, oh, maybe water molecules can fit through this perfectly and nothing else can. And, you know, it'll be like this perfect sieve to, we'll have like cheap and, you know, basic, practically free, uh, desalination that it, it's all just a bunch of baloney because you have to fight against this 
this pressure gradient. And so if you're somehow imagining that you don't have to anymore, you're just silly, <laughs> dumb, <laughs> to, to be kind. Um, and so it turns out that our current technologies are actually fairly close to not adding too much extra resistance beyond this pressure requirement. Um, so it's we're actually not too far from having ideal materials. So maybe there's a little bit of room for growth, but it's, we're never going to have desalination that is, you know, orders of magnitude cheaper because we're simply fighting, you know, on a chemical basis, we're either doing this or maybe we're doing something with heat. So we're driving, we're using enough energy to have enough heat to, to drive the water to boil, um, maybe to create a vacuum to decrease that boiling point, whatever we're doing. And salt also increases the boiling point of, of water. So there's um, several challenges there. It's going to be energy intensive regardless. So that it's kind of a, a side note on desalination uh, rumors uh, for you here. Okay, so actually before we go to that one, the other thing I'm going to say is there's also a, a, um, a topic where you can actually go into what's called forward osmosis. This is sometimes useful if you have a situation where you have um, dirty water that is not particularly salty. So you can actually make use of a membrane that's going to pull your water into a saltier basin of water. If you want to just separate some particles or something, and you have a reservoir of saltier water that you'd like to have the water in, you can actually do that, and it's going to be driven by the osmos osmotic pressure, and you'll have this forward osmosis. So there's, there's some applications where that may actually be useful. Um, for, for instance, if you have a wastewater treatment plant, and you've got just wastewater, it's usually a little bit salty, but maybe you have it up next to a, an ocean, and that ocean is salty and you want to discharge into the ocean, but you want to clean it first. You could actually just put a forward osmosis membrane there, take the, that salty water up right next to it and be letting that pressure gradient drive your filtration across and be discharging purified wastewater into the ocean water. You don't care if you dilute the ocean water a little bit, it's not really going to do any harm as long as you disperse it properly then you're left with a smaller amount of just your, your wastewater um, retente. So that's, that's one example, and I, I've, I've heard of some others, um, and you might be able to combine things like that with, uh, let's say, ion selectivity. So maybe, maybe you want to get rid of your nitrate, um, maybe, or you know, one example is, um, Alga culture, so growing algae for for uh, either biofuels or some commercial product. Maybe you can make some pharmaceutical with them. So if you have a saltwater algae you're growing, and then you have wastewater that has lots of nitrate in it. Nitrate is a fertilizer for the algae, so you'd like the nitrate to go across. That would be good. But, yeah, but you also want to clean this stuff. You might be able to make use of a membrane that's letting the nitrate go across selectively, but keeping all the other junk. So you might be able to do a kind of a dual purpose there, nutrient recovery and filtration, all while using that, os that forward osmosis to drive the filtration for you. So saving on a whole bunch of different fronts. So there's some, some rather niche um, opportunities or applications, but they're, they're fairly interesting. Um, so we'll say, as an example, wastewater discharge into salty water. Okay. So wanted to talk just uh, briefly about electrodialysis. Um, similar in some ways. Uh, but essentially we're using an electrical gradient instead of the, um, instead of pressure. So if, we, if you consider that we have a bunch of solutes 
we can apply an electrical gradient and push charged solutes one way or the other, right? So that's what we're gonna do. And we can do that applying an electrical field. Um, again, we're, we're adding this energy here, but we can, when we do so, it's, we can, we can do that and be spending kind of a similar, a similar cost. So in this case, we want, we're, we're gonna gain clean water by, again, having selective permeation of solutes. So we, we have membranes that we are, um, that are ion selective and we're pushing specific types of ions through the membranes um, rather than pushing water across them. So as an example here, um, we're essentially using these ion exchange membranes. And this, is, this would be kind of an electrochemical cell where we have an anion exchange membrane that will allow chloride essentially to be exchanged. And maybe it's the case that chloride is incorporated here and a chloride that happened to be over here is kicked off. I'm not, not sure actually the exact details of how it would normally happen. But the net effect is a transport of that um, anion across that membrane. On the flip side, we have a sodium ion going through the same type of process on the other side, so cation exchange membrane. So with that, we if we put an anode on one side and a cathode on the other, um, we can, in this case, be pulling those ions out of solution by applying an electrical field across them. Um, and so this is essentially where we're adding our energy to, to pull them across. And then what we're, we end up with is desalted or desalinated water in this channel between. Because um, one, one of the things you have to consider here is you have to maintain charge balance in solution. So any anytime you have a solution, you're going to be at charge balance. So if you're just pulling all of the chloride out of there, or you're trying to, you're going to have a situation where you have so many, so many sodiums, the only other thing that could balance them is OH minus, and we have a bit of a hard limit for that with our pH scale. Um, if you remember OH minus, the product here of that and H plus is equal to 10 to the minus 14th. So, uh, you know, if you were to look at the even pH of 12 or 13 or so, pH even of 14, um, we have kind of a, a bit of a limit of how many OH minuses we would have there. Not to mention the, the disaster that would probably be on your system getting it that basic. So if, it, if the solution was really driven to, and that's the only, only possible way you were able to come up with more anions or on the flip side, more cations and so more H plus, uh, I, I think I said that a little bit backwards, make it really acidic, for example, um, if that's the only way it's going to happen, well, first, you're going to have a limit and not be able to push past that. But second, you're going to have a very caustic or very acidic um, situation that's probably just going to deteriorate your membranes pretty quick. So um, there is some, you know, several reasons to be uh, aware of your, your net balance there. Um, and making sure that you're capable of doing so. But otherwise, you're essentially doing the same thing. You're applying this, instead of a pressure, you're doing an electrical gradient, but it's again, just like that Gibbs free energy, it's an energy gradient applying and allowing for your, um, your solutes to be separated, given that we have some cool membrane that can do that separation. Okay, so I think, I think that's actually all I've got for you today. Um, so next time, so I do apologize. I think maybe I said the homework was due today. I even confused myself with that. Last night I was starting, I was preparing for today and I was like starting to work through the homework. Then I realized actually I was, the exam review is Thursday, you know, is uh, Thursday this week. The exam is um, next time. So apologize if you turned it in earlier than you had to, but um, homework is due Thursday. Um, and then we'll have the exam a week from today. So next time we'll, we'll go through the homework 
solutions there. And I'll, I'll walk through. So Thursday will definitely be in person. Earlier, I was saying that you know if it's rainy like this, everybody's feeling like staying from home. I'll, I'll send an email early in the morning. We'll just all go, go fully online if it's, if it's nasty. But we're going to be in person for the review. I want to do that in person for sure. We'll be in person for the exam. Um, so rain or shine for those. Um, and the other thing I'll do is I'll kind of walk through the topics we're covering and kind of some of the expectations. So it, the exam itself is going to be um, mostly quantitative, but I will add in some kind of flavor about the stuff we've learned. Um, you know, maybe we're not doing a computation on electrodialysis, but maybe I'm going to, you know, we're not testing on electrodial on membranes on the exam. But if we were, maybe I'd ask you something about um, what you thought of the situation, you know, what would happen if the cation exchange membrane started failing, you know, what would be the implications? I might ask you something to kind of critical thinking explain based on the topic. So we'll, we'll kind of go over those expectations next time, um, kind of just document it, um, points to study from and answer any questions you have um, as well. All right, so that's all I've got. Um, we'll see you on Thursday.